Hello everyone, I'm Carl with Lunchbox Sessions. Welcome to our first YouTube Live in quite a while. It's great to have you back, it's great to be with you. Our next Live is scheduled for October 11, Controlling Hydraulic Flow. So mark your calendar for that one or bookmark lunchboxsessions.com slash live and watch for information there or keep an eye on our YouTube channel. Great to have participants with us already today from India and from Spain. Welcome to our live. Always happy for the conversations that go back and forth between myself and so many of you in hydraulic professions, engineering, system design problem solvers, hydraulic components companies. It's great to hear from you and uh, we really appreciate the knowledge that you share with us as we build our materials as well. Today in hydraulic system pressure adjustments we'll be covering topics such as what is pressure, where does it show up in a hydraulic system, where do you measure it, why is it good to limit pressure? What types of pressure limiting devices, valves, exist? And how do you safely make adjustments? So in brief, we're going to look at how to limit pressure with a relief valve, different kinds. We'll look at how to limit hydraulic pressure with pressure reducing valves. And then for our big finish, You'll want to play along with this one and stay till the end. We'll have a simulation for you to use that we've set free on lunchboxsessions.com. And that will be how to set the hydraulic power unit pressures, especially if you've got a relief valve and a pressure compensated pump. So stay with us to the end to see that sequence. That's always a very useful one for so many of our listeners. You'll also notice in the window below where you're watching me that there is a list of links or resources to just some of the components that will show up in today's session. As a safety reminder, the demonstrations and procedures that you'll see performed here today will not be enough if your experience and training is limited. So if you're early on with your hydraulics work, find a mentor who is a pro. Log into your YouTube account or your Google services and you'll be able to chat and ask questions with us as we're moving along. And again, feel free to let us know where you're from. You can email us, info at lunchboxsessions.com or look for me, Carl Dyke, industrial teacher on LinkedIn. I'm quite easy to find. Shout out to our friends at Fluid Power World, your resource for components and for design and engineering knowledge. Our major sponsor today is Sun Hydraulics. Sun Hydraulics is a globally recognized company that specializes in designing and manufacturing high-performance hydraulic cartridge valves and manifolds. Sun's client base spans across various industries, including industrial manufacturing, mobile equipment, and machine manufacturers. Sun's recent product lineup showcases their dedication to cutting-edge solutions. One such example is Energen, a revolutionary regenerative solution that enables users to transform power loss into valuable energy. Additionally, Sun offers eSense, an energy efficient counterbalance solution that delivers 100% performance at 30% of the power consumption, ensuring significant energy savings. Sun's products play a vital role as integral components in fluid power systems. At Sun Hydraulics, they are dedicated to providing high performance solutions that drive efficiency and productivity for their valued customers. Hey, great to see others signing in. Welcome from Tunisia, welcome from Nigeria. Great to have you with us in our live broadcast today. Thank you for your welcoming words. 
All right. With hydraulic motion control, it is so important not to permit an outward failure of a component. It gets dangerous really fast. Spilling oil has obvious environmental consequences. In force control hydraulics, it is so important to be able to modulate pressure. But what is pressure? Well, according to Oxford, pressure is the continuous physical force exerted on or against an object by something in contact with it. That something, in our case, is hydraulic fluid. Merriam Webster says pressure is the force or thrust exerted over a surface divided by its area. Yeah, I like that. Now we're talking square inches or square centimeters, a very important concept in hydraulics. So it's all about force or a force exerted. So simply put then, all we have to do to limit force is detect a maximum value, maximum pressure value, and then somehow place a limit, regulate. That's the game. The hydraulic pressure relief valve is a very popular component to make sure that pressure is limited. The word relief, I find that just a little bit misleading. If you've had some challenging food and you take an antacid tablet, you're expecting the pain to go away. But in hydraulics, with a relief valve, it doesn't take the pressure away, but it does put a limit. So if it's relieving something, it's, it's relieving the system from having a bad overpressure condition. That's where the word relief plays its best role. Well, let's have a look at our first relief valve in action with this simulation on Lunchbox Sessions. You're welcome to follow along with the links that are provided. This is a direct acting style relief valve. A direct acting relief valve is one that has only one spring and one poppet. In the upper right of the screen, you see the cutaway. And as I mouse over various parts of the relief valve in cutaway, and you look to the lower left, you'll see the matching parts of the symbol also being highlighted. That's a great way to find out about how to read the hydraulic symbol for basic relief valve. And of course, the relief valve, if you're looking at the symbol in the lower left, you notice that it is drawn in such a way with the poppet out of alignment from the two ports. Many people will say that this is a normally closed type of pressure valve. Yeah, that can get a little confusing if you're into electrical circuits. I like to say it's a normally blocking pressure valve. I think that also works. On the shelf, let's say. The on the shelf status for a relief valve is that the spring forces it closed. Well, let's take it for a drive and see how it performs. So our hydraulic system is pretty simple. We've got a hydraulic pump putting out a particular flow rate, and we intend for the flow to turn a hydraulic motor. Perhaps the hydraulic motor is turning a conveyor, a winch, an auger, whatever that might be. And since we're just working with the symbol here in the left side of the screen, we need some way of understanding where hydraulic system pressure develops, why it builds. So in our symbol, we've got a very simple brake shoe rubbing against the hydraulic motor symbol. Can you do that? We did it. And then there's a load platform on top. I'm going to go ahead and just for the moment, I'm going to increase the setting. You'll notice that I'm tensioning the spring on the relief valve if you're looking in the cutaway. I'm going to set that relief valve to its maximum value. That's not a setting procedure. That's just me getting ready to demonstrate something. And then the lower slider here will move that along and be able to increase resistance by putting a larger and larger load on that brake shoe loading platform that is rubbing against the motor symbol. We see the pressure is becoming higher on the pressure gauge. And we also notice 
that there is a red line coming up the left side, the vertical axis of the graph. That graph that you see there is going to show us if and when flow is passing through the relief valve. And by the way, you can change the units at any time you like to metric. If you prefer to see your pressure in bar, you could do that as well. And so I'm going to go ahead and increase resistance just past 475. And we'll just jump up a little bit. We can see that that relief valve is not yet open. And so there we are at a pressure now where the relief valve has reached its cracking value. And so what we'll notice is that out of our total 20 gallons per minute of flow from the pump, we'll see that one gallon per minute is now passing through the relief valve. That's the cracking pressure. And then some might say, hey, does that mean that our relief valve is set to 527 PSI as being shown on that gauge? Well, perhaps, but that's only when one gallon per minute is passing through. And if it's a system relief valve, which is meant to protect us, from seeing a dangerous situation for the entire hydraulic system or a compromising pressure, then that's not actually the pressure setting we're most interested in yet. Okay, and so 527 PSI, and so if we increase the resistance, which is a larger mass on the brake shoe brick stacker, we are now at 10 gallons per minute from the pump passing through the relief valve to tank. Arguably, this is still not the relief valve setting if our hydraulic motor is turning not the system relief valve setting. So I'm going to increase the resistance quite a bit farther, and here I am now at 970 PSI pressure, finding out that our hydraulic motor is turning, albeit very slowly. I'm just gonna back that down to 950 or so, 940, sure, that's great. You know, and what we see here on the right-hand side, I'm just going to zoom in a bit on our graph, what we see here on the right hand side is we see a couple of terms. We see cracking pressure. That's when the relief valve first opened when we were at 500 PSI. And then we see the relief setting, which if I really overload that brake shoe brick stacker on that hydraulic motor and stall that motor, now all of our pumps flow is passing through the relief valve. And really that's the true full flow relief valve setting. And everything in between there is often referred to as a pressure override. So I'll zoom back out now that we've gotten used to that. And of course, what you're probably thinking, and you would be correct to do so, is that perhaps there's a bit of inefficiency here. Because what if, what if, what if we need to keep that hydraulic motor running at its normal speed right up to 950 PSI or something very close to it? In this case, with a 500 PSI pressure override, we would have to set the relief valve at least 500 PSI higher yet. And that might be dangerous and certainly would come at an energy efficiency cost. But single spring, single poppet, direct acting relief valves do have their place. Okay, and great to see so many of you joining us. We've got participants from Russia and other countries, Nigeria, so thank you for joining in with us today. Great to have you. We're just into looking at the principles of a direct acting relief valve. And so let's head over to the hydraulic panel now. And let's get ready to do our first demonstration of exactly this feature that I've been speaking about here. But let's have a look at it from a different point of view. So 
Here we are looking at a very simple relief valve. It's a direct acting relief valve. It has only one spring and one poppet in it. And of course, we always put the pressure gauge on the side of the relief valve where that sense line is, where the relief valve is trying to sense the activity of the pressure. So that's on the inlet for a pressure relief valve. That's this gauge here. It's on port one. And of course, port two is on its way directly back to tank. It's been adjusted to a value where if I pump into that relief valve with a hand pump, and I'm going to give this hand pump here about two pumps per second, I already calculated that that's roughly one twelfth of a gallon per minute. And so here we go. Let me bring that pressure up. And we'll find out that the pressure setting appears to be somewhere around 500 PSI, 35 bar. That appears to be the pressure setting of that relief valve. Well, let's rearrange things a little bit. That's while that relief valve is receiving one twelfth of a gallon per minute. What happens if all of a sudden we go to an electric motor driven hydraulic pump and we introduce a quarter of a gallon per minute, approximately one liter per minute. Now what we'll notice is that that same relief valve that was at 500 PSI now appears to be at 600 PSI, roughly 40 bar. What happens if we go to our prime mover, or if we go to our, our pump and we increase the size of the pump and we tell the pump, hey, give us half a gallon a minute, roughly two liters per minute. Now we're going to see that that same relief valve setting is about 700. What happens if we go up to 0.75 gallons per minute, roughly three liters per minute? And now we'll find out that that same relief valve that started out at 500 PSI setting with the hand pump He's now at 800 PSI. So that is the action of a single spring, single poppet, direct acting relief valve. I'm just going to turn my maximum flow rate back down so that we're ready for another experiment coming up. That's the action of a relief valve that has a single spring, single poppet, direct acting relief valve. Just going to open one file here for a moment. Just give me one second. Just have to get my file open so that I can see the questions that you're asking. Great that we've got participants from Brazil as well. Welcome Brazil. And one of the questions that has come up this morning is, Carl, is, is it true that piloted relief valves have a cracking pressure nearest to the setting than simple relief valves? Hey, you're one step ahead of me. That is exactly where we're going next. So thank you for that great question. That is exactly the road we're going down next. So one second here. I'll get back to my notes and let's get into that style. Let's get into pilot operated relief valves. All right, so if you've been playing along and you saw some of the links for some of the products we're using, that first relief valve is an RBAE model relief valve from Sun. You can see that it's described right there as a direct acting relief valve. The rated capacity for it is pretty small, 2.5 gallons per minute. Is that meant to be a main system relief valve? No. It's much more commonly being used as a valve that can pilot another relief valve. So one relief valve piloting another relief valve. That's coming up in a moment. But if we move further down and we have a look at 
some of the performance curves. Let's just have a look at a performance curve here for a moment. If we take a look at this graph and we say to ourselves, if, if it's been set, if this relief valve has been set to start opening, allowing the smallest amount of flow. Flow is along the horizontal axis here. And if it's set for 1,000 PSI to start allowing a little bit of flow, by the time we are up to one gallon per minute, we didn't even get that high in my experiment, but by the time we're up to one gallon per minute, we're easily, what, 500 PSI higher? Yeah, we were in almost up to numbers that high with, um, with three quarters of a gallon per minute, three liters per minute. So I think you saw exactly that line. You saw that slope, okay? And perhaps something else we'll just draw quick attention to is that the response time of a direct acting relief valve, a single spring, single poppet, is usually pretty, pretty small, pretty quick response, two milliseconds. So when we switch over to pilot operated relief valves, let's go to the RVBA as an example. This one a little larger, seven and a half gallons per minute. We're going to have a look at this one in a moment. Let's go and have a look at the performance curve here and find that when at 1,000 PSI cracking pressure, I'm in the lower left-hand corner, lower left square on the graph, that at 1,000 PSI, and then by the time we're up at three quarters of a gallon a minute, the one gallon a minute, well, the pressure has hardly gone up at all. And that's telling us something is a little bit different about this type of relief valve. And as we go back to the top here and see that it's referred to as a pilot-operated balanced piston relief valve, and we look at the simple cutaway, we'll see that there are two springs and two poppets. Even though the symbol itself is often not going to reveal that there's two springs and two poppets, a pilot-operated relief valve has that, two springs and two poppets. So let's jump now to lunchbox sessions and have a look at the anatomy and behavior of a balanced style pilot operated relief valve. This one is styled after fairly common uh, cast body style relief valves. We'll switch back to a screw and cartridge in a moment. But if we set the relief setting again all the way to the top on this one and I bring the resistance up, you saw this before on the brick stacker, we're coming up on the left side of the graph there, the red line up to 438. You'll see that there on the system pressure gauge. Just while you're getting used to what to look at, you'll see that in this case we've decided to expand the symbol to a detailed symbol to let you see all of the features. You'll see that as you mouse over the various poppets and springs and components, Oh, and a very important component called the balance orifice. See where that one is highlighted on the symbol. Or I'll go over to the symbol and have a look at it over there. And we'll notice, of course, that that becomes a very important component in operating the relief valve with a very small amount of pilot flow in that pilot section at the top and also allowing us to create a pressure drop once that pilot poppet has cracked open. So I'll bring the resistance up over 500. Oh, this time our relief valve didn't open. Okay, we were set in the previous example with a direct acting relief valve. It was also set to 1000 PSI but the direct acting relief valve was already open, dividing flow, slowing down our hydraulic motor, adding heat. In this case, it's not happening. The relief valve hasn't opened. Should we be worried? Is this relief valve going to fail us? Here we are increasing the resistance. We're up at 850 PSI. And remember, what we're after perhaps in this system is protection at 1,000 PSI. Here we are at 925, 933, 948. I think we're right on the edge of seeing relief valves starting to happen. Here it comes. So right at 950, right at 9, oh, it's so touchy. It's hard to even find that trigger point because the valve is very sensitive. And in a very small band of pressure increase, a very small override, we go all the way from the cracking pressure to the full flow relief setting in a very small increase. What's the advantage here? Well, the advantage is, in this case, the relief valve does not have to be set much higher than that maximum safe pressure 
where you still intended to keep all of the pumps flow inside the application part of the hydraulics, which in this case was running the hydraulic motor. That's perhaps how the, the work gets done for this machinery and perhaps how the business makes its money. So that's the advantage of working with two springs and two poppets. Let me just have a look and see how things are going with, with questions, perhaps. Yeah, so hopefully that helped answer that question that um, relief valves, pilot-operated relief valves have a cracking pressure nearest to the setting. Then relief valves, yeah, I think that what we were addressing there with that very small amount of pressure override as you see it on the right side of the graph, yes, that is an answer to that question, I think, in your case. So hopefully that was helpful. One moment to get back to my notes. And so, I think, let's go back to the hydraulic training panel now and let's do the same test on a balanced style pilot operated relief valve and see firsthand from a hand pump and from electrically driven pump how that happens. Okay, I've just got to rearrange a little bit. That one has to go here. We always need a path back to tank. This particular relief valve that I'm using here now, RVBA, it has a vent port. But this is not a pilot drain. It's a vent port. It's a remote control port where I could have this relief valve alternately controlled by another direct acting relief valve. But you don't have to use it. And at this moment, I choose not to. All right, still got my pressure gauge on the sense line, which is on the inlet, port one. This is where we pick up the system pressure and where we adjust it. So let me get the hand pump going, and let's just see where this relief valve is set at. Like the previous example, if I pump about twice per second, we should be able to get about 500 PSI. And... Uh, there we go, it just took a second to come up. There we go, about 500 PSI is the setting pressure at the moment for this relief valve if, if I'm pushing only about 1 12th of a gallon per minute. So if this is the type of relief valve that I was describing a second ago, let's find out. Oops, i got to make some connection changes I didn't do yet. Let's take that off there. And I need the pumps flow. There we go. And pressure gauge. Okay. So if I was at roughly 500 PSI or a little bit more when I was hand pumping, which was a twelfth of a gallon per minute, now we are at a quarter of a gallon per minute the pressure came up perhaps a little bit, perhaps 50 PSI. And as I continue to increase the available flow, I'm going to now push half a gallon a minute, roughly two liters per minute through the relief valve. And I think what you'll notice is that the pressure didn't go up very much. And I'll go all the way to three quarters of a gallon per minute, roughly three liters per minute. And on the earlier example with the direct acting, if I remember right, we were already up at, at 800 or more PSI. And here perhaps we've gone up 100 or 125 PSI as we moved through the same range of changes of flow from 1 12th of a gallon per minute to 3 quarters of a gallon per minute. So we're seeing evidence here that the relief valve stays in that very na narrow band between cracking pressure and full system flow. That's that minimal override that you see here. All right, so we've had a look at that one. And hey, welcome participants from China, from Pakistan. We've got participants from the United States, from Michigan. Thanks for joining us today. I'll just make sure I'm keeping up with questions if there are any. So we're good there. 
All right, let's move along then. And yeah, one relief valve can pilot another is the uh, scenario I was speaking about a moment ago. Oh, but before we get there, let's have a look at lunchbox sessions again. We'll see a screw-in cartridge style valve that has pilot operating control features. All of what you saw a moment ago in the cast body style balanced pilot operated relief valve can be done in screw in cartridge format, just simply stacking one spring chamber and pop it directly on top and in line with the other. If we take the relief setting and crank it all the way to the top just to be the same as what we saw on others, then we find out that we get this exact same performance. Here we are up at a very high pressure, perhaps 950, even though our relief valve is set to 1000, it isn't open yet. And then all of a sudden, the beauty that we have of creating that, that pressure differential across the balance orifice, it occurs very suddenly as oil starts to flow and we only need a pressure difference from the bottom side of the piston to the upper side that is just a little bit more than the value of that main spool spring. That main spool spring is typically the weak spring that represents that small pressure override. The pilot section where there's a very small amount of pilot flow is pushed against a small surface area poppet but a very stiff spring. So that is the spring chamber where the higher pressures are set, perhaps up into the thousands of PSI, hundreds of bar pressure. Uh, that is the beauty of the balance style relief valve. But once again, remember that in order to set a relief valve, whatever style it is, we have to ensure a state where there's no flow from the pump through the rest of the hydraulic system. If this relief valve is there to be your system relief valve and try to do its best to look after the, the whole of the system, then flow to the rest of the hydraulic system where the directional valves and actuators are has to be blocked out. And that is typically done by, in most cases, by putting the directional valves in the neutral position. Some cases, perhaps on this label here where it says two system, you might have to have a ball valve that gets closed in. It depends on the design of your hydraulic system. But if we're going to ensure that this is the system relief valve, then we have to make sure that all of the pump's flow is passing through that relief valve when we make the adjustment which you see me making here. Now, I've got the resistance of the entire hydraulic system turned up to the maximum, perhaps meaning that cylinders have been deadheaded, but for relief valve setting, it would be much safer and more realistic to expect that we've found a place to close off the hydraulic flow coming from the pump into the rest of the system where directional valves and actuators are, exist, allowing us to safely set the relief valve while watching a system pressure gauge. As you turn the adjustment screw, for a relief valve, if a gauge isn't following your every turn of that screw, then stop and reevaluate. Something is not right with your procedure, with your equipment. And again, if you're new to hydraulic maintenance work, work with a mentor, somebody who is a pro who's done it many times. That is key to keeping you safe as you make these kinds of adjustments. As I mentioned earlier, it is easy enough to control one relief valve with another. So what you're seeing here now on this screen is both of the relief valves that I just demonstrated a moment ago. In fact, uh, the relief valve on the left has one additional feature, which is a port for external drain. Some relief valves do have that feature, and that allows the relief valve to be much more immune to any type of resistance or change of pressure that might occur in the main return to the main return to tank line. If anything is going on on the main passage back to tank in a hydraulic system that might cause a fluctuation in return line pressure, that effectively causes the relief valve setting to change a little bit. Whatever resistance happens on that return to tank, 
can be added directly to the relief valve setting, and that can be undesirable. So some relief valves feature an external drain, and that makes it much easier to keep the relief valve accurately set, no matter what type of traffic is happening on that return to tank line that might be shared with other parts of the hydraulic system. But jumping to the idea of remote control, the single acting relief valve I showed you first, designed so small and designed primarily that one for, uh, for pilot functioning, what you see here is that we've duplicated remotely pretty much the exact same functionality and pilot valve as what is built into the main relief valve. That means that at a remote location a operator could dial for a system pressure that is lower than the setting on the main relief valve. And the relieving action still happens down here on the bottom of the main relief valve where we control the amount of oil perhaps from a fixed displacement pump that is being directed back to tank so as to not allow an overpressure condition but alternately if you're watching that video play you'll see that if the remote is set lower as it is now than what is happening on the main reliefs pilot one can control one relief valve with another, a remote pilot. And I'm only drawing your attention to this because in a moment we'll have a look at some interesting features that belong to the world of pressure reducing valve, a completely different category of pressure valve. Yeah, if we went to one more example, perhaps some of you know this very, very famous model, uh, a model CT relief valve. It's been in place a long time in industry. It's, it's a classic. I'm just going to turn the relief setting all the way up. And yeah, perhaps we get our resistance to a point in the hydraulic system where we need to see relief action. You see that balance orifice right in the main piston. And what you notice on this one also is that there is a vent connection on this one as well where a second relief valve can be added as a remote pilot. Those two pilots, if you're watching the plumbing, looking at it carefully, the pilot that is on board the main relief valve versus the remote, those two pilots are in parallel with each other. Both of them have a flow that is headed back to tank. All right, so we've had a look at some examples there, and many of those you are able to work with on your own in lunchbox sessions for today and tomorrow. So feel free to make use of those to help with your learning. Let me just check and see. Any questions at this point? We've got one. Let me have a look and see. Uh, Johannes is asking, I want to obtain a fixed pressure in an open center system with variable flow. Okay, so you've got variable flow and you've got an open center system. An open center system typically is where if one lets go of the directional valves, directional valves spring to neutral, that we find that the pump flow is circulating freely at a very low pressure, close to zero. Quite often that means there's a gear pump involved. And Johannes, you want to obtain a fixed pressure. It's an older farm tractor. What valve can I use? Well, you know, I mean, I guess in a way, that's, that's tricky. I, I would maybe have to hear a little bit more about your scenario. But, you know, the pressure in a hydraulic system, as you know, is dependent on how much loading is happening against the flow of oil as it moves into a hydraulic cylinder. And if that cylinder is extending and having to push on a, a boom to lift the boom, let's say, on a farm tractor for the front end loader, it depends on how heavy that is. But if you're saying fixed pressure, perhaps you're thinking about a maximum fixed pressure. And if that's the case for... Uh, uh, for your tractor, if you're wanting to make sure that your, your top end pressure is always in a, in a correct band, perhaps that means uh, a good use for a good uh, relief valve to be applied there would be a balanced style pilot operated relief valve. I'll think a little bit more about your question here as we're going and see if I can uh, 
understand better context. And if there's additional information you want to, to throw my way, I'll try to address it again once I've read that. And if we didn't welcome you earlier, viewers from Iran, from Egypt, welcome to our YouTube Live today. And I hope I've caught all the countries that are participating. Great to have all of you with us. Let's see here. I'll just check my notes and see where I am. Yeah, you know what? One thing I wanted to make clear also in the spec sheets that we were looking at, you know, that second one, which was a pilot-operated balance style relief valve, what I didn't do is take you to the data to notice that instead of two milliseconds response time, the more efficient relief valve in terms of a pressure override is perhaps a little slower, 10 milliseconds. This is not uncommon. So the direct acting relief valve is perhaps not as energy efficient, but gets into action quicker with relieving. Whereas when you're flowing oil through that balance orifice and the pilot section cracks open, it takes just a little longer for that pressure differential to develop and then actually move the poppet. So 10 milliseconds is still a fairly short amount of time. So unless you've got very quick uh, developing disastrous pressure spikes, which quite often means then that a direct acting relief valve gets located right close to where those bad pressure spikes occur, such as a cylinder. But if you don't need that level of protection uh, in terms of speed, then with the pilot operated relief valve, you gain efficiency, but just a little slower response time. All right, I uh, just wanted to make sure that was clear. And let's move now to a completely different topic. We'll move on to a new type of pressure valve. Actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm not quite done with relief valves. Let me go back there and think about relief valves. Is it always about screw threads and springs to make a relief valve adjustment? Is it always about turning a screw and compressing a spring? Well, the answer to that is no. Electromagnets, solenoids, are also great for jumping into action, but not the on-off kind, not the type of solenoid that you turn on or off. So now we're going to talk for just a minute about a proportional valve. You'll see in the, in the notes for product links, I've hooked up a proportional pressure relief valve. In this case, it is from Von Flu. It's a BVI PM22. The one I've got is rated for up to 63 bar pressure adjustment, but I wanted you to have a look at this one. Very curious one that we have here in our collection. I wanted you to have a look at the symbol. It's still a normally blocking relief valve, and we see the sense line is on port one on the inlet, and all of that is normal and good. But what's interesting is to notice that the solenoid, there's the symbol for a solenoid. When it's got a diagonal arrow through it, it's a variable solenoid, so it's not an on-off solenoid. You've got to find a way to send variable current, which, which means you'll need some type of a controller board, an amplifier, in order to achieve that. But what's interesting to note about the symbol is that in this particular unique instance, the solenoid opposes the spring. In so many electrohydraulic proportional valves, the solenoid takes the place of a spring and pushes that poppet towards closure. In this case, this one is set up just the opposite, and that's why I wanted to show it to you. This one has inverted action, and what we're going to find out is that zero current being sent to this relief valve's proportional solenoid is going to be the high pressure setting and high current, which will be 660 milliamps, you'll see it here as we work on the panel in a moment, high current is going to bring us to our low pressure. So this is a sort of a quirky example of a, of a relief valve, and, but it's popular quite often in mobile machines where you want a, a circuit that will fail safe to full pressure. Perhaps the, the, a wire falls off, uh, the valve rough road for a mobile machine, 
and perhaps it's a circuit where a pump is delivering flow to a hydraulic motor. The hydraulic motor is perhaps turning a fan for cooling, and, and so if something goes wrong, we want the fan to just go at full, full speed. Well, let's go now to the hydraulic panel, and let's have a look at that type of valve in action here. So just let me get a few things ready. get some hydraulic pressure from where we need it. All right, so come on over and have a look at what we have here. We've got a system where we've still got our pressure gauge on port one. Port two is returning to tank. I've chosen to work with a proportional amplifier that simply slides on to a very common DIN Hirschman type of valve connector. Oh, I probably shouldn't have taken that off. That'll make it hard. I've got the cover off. Hopefully everything is fine there. And as I mentioned, let me get my jog box ready now. Make sure that I still have the variable current. Yes, yeah, so if you're looking at the at the readout, I've got it set to show variable current as I'm turning the potentiometer. I'll turn it down now, and as I turn it back towards zero, we'll see on the display that the current on the display in the valve is dropping back down to zero milliamps. So there we come back down to zero as I turn counterclockwise. Okay, so in this case, I've turned, it, I've turned the signal that I'm sending to the proportional relief valve right down to zero. And as you remember, this is an inverted system. So now I'm going to go turn on the hydraulic power unit. And there we go. And so this one rated for 63 bar, roughly 900 PSI at maximum. We see that value on the pressure gauge. And an armature being powered into position by a variable current solenoid. But in this case, a spring inside at this moment with no current, a spring is keeping that relief valve at its maximum setting. And then as I turn up the current, going to the solenoid, we'll find out that the pressure is dropping. So in this case, the proportional solenoid's job is to be, is to be in opposition to the spring and to tell the spring to back off and let the poppet inside this relief valve open. So here, I'll try and bring two things together in the frame. So as I'm, as I'm turning the current up towards the maximum value, I'm getting the lowest possible pressure. I've got a little bit of line resistance in the system and what have you, and pressure drops with hoses and poppets and fittings, so I can't quite get to zero, but fairly low value, as you can see there on the pressure gauge. And once again, I'll turn the value back up. Maybe we can even get the current there in the screen as well, if you're watching the, the valve control board. So I'll turn the current down 200 milliamps, 150 milliamps, we're heading towards zero milliamps and we're coming back up to the highest pressure. So isn't that an interesting one? That's an inverse control profile and kind of a unique feature, but a popular one in many cases. All right, let's head back to lunchbox sessions and have a look at have a look at more valves. I hope that's helpful to see that type of scenario. Do we have any questions that I need to answer? I've got a few, so let me switch over to my questions screen there. Jordy is asking, in case of water hammer, yeah, fluid hammer, water hammer, yeah, that can really shake things up and bang things around. Direct uh, operated relief valve, I'm assuming, is faster than pilot operated relief valve? Yes, it is. Yeah, the, I know it it's, uh, perhaps seems a little counterintuitive. The direct acting relief valve gets into business sooner uh, with a relief action. And of course, what you saw earlier on our graphs, let's just see if I can go back here. I'll go back in lunchbox sessions. Let's just switch back to, to this screen. You might say to yourself, hey, you know, that looks like a lot of 
of distance that that poppet has to stretch open in order to take the full flow from the pump. That's true. That is part of why you have this pressure override. But if you have a hammer, if you have a bad pressure spike in hydraulics, we're talking about a pressure curve that was probably almost vertical. And, and now with a direct acting relief valve, which is quick to open and begin, uh, even though you have this high pressure override, you're your pressure curve is actually lying almost close to horizontal. So yeah, this is what you want. Uh, a direct acting relief valve gets open sooner and busy into that relief action, the relief curve that's available to you. Yep, I hope that helps. And then um, Johannes sent a little bit more information about his scenario there. The flow that he's got varies between 16 liters and 40 liters a minute. Wants to keep a fixed pressure to the cylinder lifting the snow plow to lower the ground pressure when plowing soft gravel road but let it let the blade follow the road okay so float the pressure i want to obtain is 25 bar oh you know the johannes this is starting to sound like you are after a pressure reducing valve it is not uncommon for uh, for road plows to have an option to set the plow down on the road for float, but then decide that, no, that's too much um, direct mechanical uh, contact there with the ground, and so the cutting edges are going to get worn out or perhaps cut too hard. And then so to bring in a small amount of counter pressure from the other side of the cylinder, not enough to lift the hydraulic cylinder or the blade off the road, but simply to reduce the amount of, of natural force of that cutting edge against the ground. So yeah, that's actually a popular feature in many plow scenarios and it's typically done with some directional valving so that when you're down in that mode and you're in the right mode, you can bring in a pressure temporarily from a pressure reducing valve against uh, the side of the piston that, uh, that would provide lifting, but not enough pressure that a lift action takes place just to reduce the amount of force. Um, let's see here. In lunchbox, I think I'm done with this one, so I'm actually going to go wandering for something here and try to find it for you. In our mobile menu, something tells me civic machines. Yes, you may find some ideas perhaps with the plow truck or even from an airport runway scenario. Let's see here. We put the plow. We bring the plow all the way down. I'm trying to remember this one. And then we put it into a float control. And yes, there we go. There's that pressure reduction that gets typically adjusted once or is adjusted by proportional value. But you see a pressure reducing valve there, PRV1. And that's going to be our next topic. That is taking the available system pressure from the hydraulic system, which might, might be quite high, but then putting it into the base of the plow cylinder. Not enough to be able to lift it, but just enough to reduce the mechanical force of the cutting edge against the, against the road. I hope that helps a little bit. All right, we're going to jump now to a new topic overall. Just let me get back to my notes, because that's it for relief valves for now. Sort of. Ah, you'll see. Um, and let's go have a look at a different type of pressure valve, pressure reducing valve. So for that one, am I in the right place? Yes. So in lunchbox sessions, and it was one of the links that we provided for you that you can use for free, you'll see a pressure reducing valve. And let's just have a look first at the simplified schematic symbol. Oh yes, this is probably the weirdest pressure valve symbol going, and it has variants that are even stranger perhaps to the eye at first, but one of the giveaways for me always is that the sense line is on the downstream side. The arrow is pointing out, the valve has sent some, some flow through, but pressure monitoring is happening on the downstream side. This is where you want to create a sub-circuit type of pressure, just like Johannes just mentioned, um, to perhaps produce a counter pressure for his plow lift. And you only want to use a fraction of the pressure that's available in the hydraulic system, a step-down scenario. And typically, this type of valve will have at least three connections. Most often, there will be a pilot section drain, not optional. That has to be hooked up, or this valve will often uh, fail open. 
meaning you'll see full system pressure on the outlet even though you thought you had adjusted for a reduced pressure. And quite often the symbol is drawn showing already passing, an open type of valve. Okay, that, that's not the case for the symbol for everybody's pressure reducing valve, but it is kind of a, a general standard. So that's the simplified symbol. It's sensing and controlling on the outlet, on the downstream side, saying, hey, let's not have all of the maximum system pressure coming through. So that's the simplified symbol. If it's a pilot-operated uh, pressure-reducing valve, as this one is, if it's, let me just get some circumstances the way I might like them to be. I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. I think that'll work. If we look at the detailed schematic symbol now where we sort of spill the beans, you'll see some similarities from this symbol versus the pilot operated relief valve, but also some differences, right? First of all, the main reducer, which is the lower part of the valve, you'll see it being highlighted in the cutaway over on the right. The reducer is that large valve spool. Right now it's wide open, it's passing fluid through it. There really isn't much pressure reducing action going on. But that pilot, or sorry, that main pressure reducer spool is being piloted by a relief valve. What? Right? A moment ago I said we were done with relief valves, but the pilot section for a pressure reducing valve if it's the pilot operated type. The pilot section will typically be a relief valve. Sense is back on the inlet side. Valve is typically of the normally blocking type. So that is typically what happens. And of course, if you're looking in the cutaway here, you can clearly see that the pilot section is a direct acting relief valve. There's no doubts about that if you're looking at its design. But then when we head over to our application and we have a look at what's going on here and perhaps I'm changing things around but we're really not seeing anything noticeable happening on the outlet side because we've got a free and easy flow path for oil passing through the pressure reducing valve. This is not a good moment for a pressure reducing valve to show off what it can do. The pressure reducing valve doesn't really belong to motion control hydraulics. It actually belongs to force control hydraulics and that is where we're controlling pressure for the sake of, mac of, of, of limiting a maximum mechanical force. So we've got to use the force. We've got to get into the force mode here and in the case of our simulation we just simply stop that cylinder from moving. And we put a C-clamp on there and we're holding it in place and we're saying enough with the consumption of oil and now all of a sudden we see our pressure reducing valve has become active we have 2,000 PSI available to us from the, from the source, from the hydraulic power unit. Feel free to switch to metric or bar units if you like. But we have 2,000 PSI available to us from the system, and we're only using 50 PSI on the downstream. We've got this pressure reducing valve tightly controlling how much pressure goes into that cylinder. And so then as we turn up the setting, which works with the balance orifice that you see in the bottom of the main spool in a very similar way to the way it works with pilot operated relief valve but in this case it's to allow enough little increases in opening at the main spool opening and bring more of the system pressure through to our hydraulic cylinder. Oh, it looks like our C-clamp is bending. Right, this is force control. This is where the pressure reducing valve shows off what it can do. And it does it when there isn't a large free and easy flow path for hydraulic oil. It's the only circumstance really where the pressure reducing valve gives you tight control, limiting pressure. This time we're, we're, we're bringing the pressure down from the max to create a sub circuit that operates at a lower pressure from, from the maximum of the system. And just let me catch up with my notes to make sure I'm catching everything I was planning to do. And so, yeah, I think we're going to head over to the hydraulic training panel now and do some work with pressure reducing valves. So, okay, I just got to rearrange a few wires here, change from one jog box to a different one. 
make sure I get the black and the black and the red and the red. Make sure I light up. Yes, I've got another proportional amplifier card, currently zero current. Here's me turning it all the way up. In this case, 1.8 amps, a much larger drive to the proportional pressure reducing valve. And in fact, let's just have a look at this one for a moment, this Denison, Parker Denison R4R. You might say, hey, what's going on? There's a lot of features on here. And just to be clear, the reducer is actually only, the pressure reducer, that's that, that large spool is actually only living down here in this bottom third. That's the pressure reducing valve, crazy enough. And then what's in the middle here is actually a proportional relief valve acting as a pilot for the pressure reducer. What's above here is a manual relief valve pilot section. And so the manual relief valve pilot section we can adjust with a threaded screw and spring, that one is in parallel to the electrohydraulic proportional. So whichever of these two is set to a lower pressure value will be in charge of the pressure reducing valve, which is actually the bottom third, right? The most, perhaps the most uninteresting third, just the, just the casting. Oh, and something else that we should just take a moment to remember is that in the vast majority of pressure reducing valves, the inlet supply the, the main system pressure comes in on port B and the reduced value goes out on port A. Or if it's a screw and cartridge valve, it'll be in on two, out on one. And that is backwards or different, reversed from what you see on the vast majority of relief valves. In on B, out on A, or if it's a screw and cartridge valve, it is often in on two, out on one, the opposite of what happens with relief valves. Um, I do have to have a pilot drain, which in, a, in the cast body valves is port Y, and so you see it connected there. That is not optional. That is the pilot sections, the, which are relief valves. They have to have a complete path back to tank, so we have to allow full drain from the pilot sections back to tank. Otherwise, we won't have control over the reducer. So that's the minimum. And then you can see there is actually a port X on this one. This one has a port X, and that's an optional vent port where we could choose yet uh, to connect to uh, that first relief valve, perhaps, that we studied today. And we could have a third pilot section. It, too, would be in parallel. I don't know why we would want so many, but lots of different control options. All right, so I've got my current turned down to the minimum. Just going to go turn on my pump and I better make sure I've got valves in the correct orientation. That needs to be open. That needs to point that way. Nothing on our reliefs. Okay, I think we'll be able to do pressure reduction. So, force control. How will we see the useful effect of a pressure reducing valve. Well, we'll see pressure build on the gauge here on the outlet, which is port A, the outlet. Or if we follow this hose and we head up here, we will see that we've got a hydraulic cylinder pushing against and compressing a spring. That is also a good way to see the effect of force control. These two double acting cylinders, I've actually converted them into being single acting by just venting the rod end of both of those short cylinders. I've vented those cylinders back to tank so that they can move freely back and forth with pressure signal only coming in on the blind end of the cylinder. And then the amount of spring compression also becomes a way of seeing what happens with force control as we build up pressure. So there's me turning up the current to Oh, 250 milliamps and we're up at 300 and so forth. I'm sending um, a 0 to 5 volt control signal to the amplifier, but the amplifier is converting that to current. We're up at 360 milliamps now when I look down there and so forth. And this one is a valve that can go quite high, but we're limited by what's coming from the power unit. And so there, there I am turning the current back down. And if we're watching the spring up there, as I turn it down, the spring is able to push the cylinder back 
because the rod end is vented, can take in makeup oil from tank. Or if I turn up the current, once again, we can see that this is force control. This is force control, the amount of compression that we give to that spring. This is the use for pressure reducing valves. It is often piloting a proportional valve spool against a spring on the opposite pilot head. So if you want to, for the moment, you could think of C11 here, our cylinder. You could think of this as, as, a, as a valve spool in a very large proportional valve or piloted valve being pushed back and forth. And of course, there would be a spring on the other end to oppose it. Same thing happens with hydraulic brakes and so many other applications. And so that's an example right there of, of a good scenario. So why does this valve have to be so large? And in fact, they make pressure reducing valves so much larger yet if pressure reducing valve isn't about flow. Well, that's because there may be moments when there has to be flow. I think often of the paper machines in the paper mills I visit where when they're done a maintenance shutdown, they'll bring two rolls back together and the force of those two rolls brought back together against each other has to have large flow while they're traveling the hydraulic cylinders and bringing the rolls together. But once the rolls touch, then they just want to have very fine control over the forces between those rolls in the paper machine for squeezing out moisture or for starting a calendaring type of process. So once once the flow capacity is done and the cylinder is extended and deadheaded or the paper machine rolls are pushing against each other, after that it's not about flow and then the pressure reducing action begins. All right, so that's one example there. I'm just going to shut off my pump for a moment and we'll move back to one more example while we're here on the panel. So, you know, perhaps if the hydraulic oil is contaminated and has bits in it, or perhaps if, um, if there isn't any need for a large flow. Well, then a pressure reducing valve could be a small pressure reducing valve. It could be the kind that is set with uh, direct action, and in this case, again, from a solenoid and an armature assembly that is going to move directly against the pressure reducing valve. So just let me get my cabling set up for that one. So this again is a pressure reducing valve, but this time from screw-in cartridge. Just got to get some patch cords in place for another Jolt box, and then we'll demonstrate that one. So this one is a screw-in cartridge. I don't know if you can see that symbol. I'll show it again in a minute when we are back on the screen. But that is quite the symbol for a pressure-reducing valve. Yeah, not easy to get in there. I, I can understand. And so, all right. So this is a screw-in cartridge style. And if you're looking at the data sheets, I'll uh, look at it again in a minute. PRDG, I believe, is the Sun data sheet I gave you in the, in the links. If you want to open that one, you'll see the symbol on the document. But once again, the outlet, which is on port 1, the inlet is on port 2. Port 3 is the, the drain back to tank, very important connection because this one also has port relieving. So if all of a sudden there's going to be some nasty back spiking from the machinery, especially in mobile machinery, if there's a nas nasty back spike against where the source pressure came from, this valve will change from pressure reducer into a port reliever to make sure that we don't get into dangerous pressure. So that's another advantage of that particular model. Let me change a few things around here and we should be good to go. Okay, so this time we'll watch the blue spring in the cylinder on the right. I'll bring my jog box in close here. And we should see the pressure coming up. There we go. So I'm up to three volts signaling. The proportional amplifier is built is built right on to the solenoid package for this sun valve. This, uh, so the amplifier is very small. is built on there. This is just a jog box that is simulating perhaps what a PLC signal uh, from an analog output card might send. And so if we're watching that blue spring there in the hydraulic cylinder, 
and we're seeing the pressure coming up as I'm signaling between 0 and 10 volts DC. Yeah, and because it has good relief action, if I turn it down quickly, the spring goes back quite fast to match the setting. It's got good relief action built right in, but again, it's a force control valve. It's not going to show you its best unless you're working in a, a more or less a dead end street, which the cylinders squishing the squeezing, compressing the springs certainly emulate quite well. So that is a direct acting electrohydraulic proportional pressure reducing valve with port relief. Whew, that was a mouthful, but yeah, that's the functionality that we've got there. Okay, let's go back to lunchbox sessions. And we'll have a look at the data sheet for that one. Yes, PRDG, if you were looking at it, there was the symbol. So a lot of people would see that symbol and think to themselves, oh my, how do I read that symbol, right? But again, you know, if you know the porting, okay, when it's at rest, it favors connecting the outlet back to tank, so it's in a drained, and the inlet pressure is, is provided on port two and block, but, so that makes it a little different than the normal pressure reducing type of valve, but you see it here in its description, it's a reducing, valve that has also relieving function, but not system relieving, right? It's work port relieving, meaning bad things that, you know, bad things, uh, just things that happen in a hydraulic system on the outlet on port one, some type of pressure shocks, and that will override. So if that pressure spike that happens in the cylinder is higher than what the pressure reducing valve is providing, even when, when the solenoid is active, <coughs> this uh, this valve will go into port relieving and vent number one back to three. Somewhere in the middle ground, uh, the valve actually is able to go closed and, and hold and lock in your pressure. And so that's the behavior for that type of pressure reducing valve. Okay, so as we get close to the end here, maybe I should stop and make sure that... Um, I've answered questions. I think we're okay for the moment. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to head towards the, the grand finale here, which maybe many of you have been waiting for. If you know your pressure compensated pump, which is another type of pressure control, so we're talking about system pressure adjustments today. If there are piston pumps in your life, then if they're variable displacement piston pumps, then in all likelihood, they have a pressure controller built right onto them, and at a minimum, you typically find a device called a pressure compensator. If there's only one adjustment for pressure, like ours has there, you're welcome to play along with this one as well. Go ahead and find it in lunchbox sessions or see the link that's been posted there for you. And so, in many hydraulic systems, that have a pressure compensated piston pump, there is often still a relief valve. And again, if that is the case, if there is a relief valve, usually the relief valve is there. Now, there's two reasons, but more often than not, the relief valve is there because it's the faster acting of the two. And if you get a very bad, sudden spike coming back towards the source, coming back towards the power unit from from the applications, from the system, then quite often the relief valve will pop open and shut just for a split second to saw the top off of a very bad pressure spike while the pump is pressure compensating. Okay, So we don't have a lot of time in today's YouTube to, uh, to cover uh, pressure compensation of piston pumps, but you'll see there's lots of other materials there on our YouTube channel to help with that. But let me just give you some examples. I'll turn the relief valve setting really high. We'll put the compensator in the middle. And if all of a sudden, so my needle valve there on the right of the simulation is just simulating or emulating what it might mean to build high pressures in the application part of the hydraulics. And perhaps we get to some point where the, where the flow is cut off, which, which actually happens in many hydraulic systems when the operator puts the valves in the neutral position, essentially cut off, and here is the pump still spinning its rotating 
um, group, the cylinder barrel, the pistons are still rotating. So you see the mimic in the lower left corner because, of course, our cutaway can only freeze a moment of time as we're rotating. And so what you need to understand when you're looking in the cutaway is that we've just frozen a moment for an inlet piston and an outlet piston, two of the, the nine pistons. The cylinder barrel is still spinning as you see it, but at least because the stroke length of the pistons has been made so short, the pump is displacing nearly zero flow, only making up for internal leakage in the pump and to operate the controller. And so we'll see flow on the case strain line for sure. I've never yet seen a hydraulic pressure compensated piston pump that didn't have flow on the case strain line when we're up in the working pressure range, especially at, at cutoff where we are now to see some flow occurring there. And so it, and it's a small percentage, of course, but that's how that works. But this action of pressure compensating and reducing the pump's flow and just holding a standby pressure, not letting it climb into dangerous towards the infinity values where, where, where the weakest link will break, a hose, perhaps bursts of fitting brakes, um, a shaft perhaps snap something bad. No, here we are regulating the pressure quite nicely and waiting for the circuit resistance to die down, waiting for a demand for flow consumption to occur again. But the relief valve is often there as a just in case. And quite often things get confused. We often run into scenarios where the client complains of over overheating and <coughs> Often in those scenari <coughs> scenarios, we find out that as pressure is increased in the system, the pump, the variable displacement pump does not go off stroke, and instead all of the oil from the pump passes through the relief valve. And as you can see right now, the relief valve setting, 694, is far below the setting of the pressure compensator. You have essentially decided not to have the advantages of a variable displacement pump, essentially having turned a variable displacement piston pump into a gear pump. Very unfortunate. So it is not supposed to be that the relief valve is set lower than the compensator. It is meant to be the other way around entirely in that the relief valve is set higher than the pressure compensator. Then as circuit resistance comes up, here's me slowly closing in on the needle valve, creating a lot of pressure. The pump goes off stroke first, which saves you lots of energy and lots of heat. Remember, the amount of power it takes to run a hydraulic system is flow times pressure. Here we have pressure, but we have very little flow. And so the energy required from the prime mover, whether it be electric motor, or uh, combustion engine is much, much less if we let the pump reduce its flow rate to near zero for the time when, uh, when the system flow is blocked or we're in some overpressure condition. The relief valve is just there for just in case. So many people ask, how do we set it? Well, if you're commissioning from, if, if things have gotten really confused and you have the luxury of shutting down, then do so. Shut down, get into a safe, low pressure condition, back out the pressure settings. Then let's start by tightening the pressure compensator all the way. Let's take the pressure compensator to its maximum adjustment till the spring is compressed. When you feel that spring fully compressed, don't keep turning. You don't need to, to torque that adjustment. Once that spring is fully compressed up there in the pressure compensator, that's good. And then with your relief valve backed all the way out, when you start up and you make sure that your system is then blinded in, that there's no consumption of flow anywhere else in the hydraulic system but through the relief valve and back to tank. And you should be at a very low flow rate, or sorry, at a very low pressure. And now you could take your relief valve setting up to whatever is indicated on your machinery manuals or schematics. We'll say in this case that we are required to take our relief valve up to 1200 PSI and perhaps our pressure compensator to be set at 900, which is 300 PSI below the relief valve. That's, that's a pretty typical 
separation to make sure the two don't interfere. Sometimes you can get it a little closer, 200 perhaps. But 300 is fairly common without wasting too much time. Don't go for lunch, you know. Sometime in the next few moments, put your wrenches now on the pressure compensator and turn it counterclockwise. And sometimes the first few turns counterclockwise on most compensators, read your pump manual to be sure, um, the first few turns doesn't change anything. The pressure gauge doesn't follow my turns of the wrench because perhaps my relief valve is set in a mid-pressure range and I overdialed my compensator all the way perhaps to a very high pressure range, but I'm bringing it down. You will hear some noise from the pump as the, as the pump controller starts to take control, and now you see that pressure gauge following my every turn of the wrench. Right? It's very important that, that the pressure setting adjustment procedure we follow shows up on a pressure gauge as we do it. But as I was saying, those first few counterclockwise turns might not show up because the compensator may be set m so much further than the relief valve. But there we can see now that the relief valve is closed. If it was vibrating before and we touched the body of it, it won't be now. If this is an exposed hose, sometimes it's a tube right through the wall of the tank, but we'll see that that has stopped vibrating. And now the pump is, the pump's own pressure controller bolted to the side is in control. Hey, a lot of people sometimes say initially when they're not yet familiar with pressure compensated pump that it's a kind of pump that has a system relief on the inside. No, not exactly. This case drain flow is not the full flow of the pump at all. It's, it's only a small, small percentage. No, nope, remember the variable displacement pressure compensated pump has a pressure controller bolted to it, yes but it's for the purpose of changing the displacement of the pump and taking it to a near zero displacement when there is nowhere for that pump flow to go. And that is triggered by pressure that you see on this internal gallery here. It's tucking behind the maximum volume adjustment screw, but it's going through A to A, a gallery in the casting. So the pressure compensator is always supervising, monitoring the pump outlet pressure. That's what you see happening there. There's tons more resources on lunchbox sessions to help you learn about pressure compensated pumps, but I wanted to show you that procedure and let you know that you can practice it there so that you've got the procedure down and that you're safe and ready to go when you have to do it on live machinery. One of my favorites, you know, when somebody says there's some overheating, is just to put my wrench on that compensator adjustment and just wiggle it back and forth a tiny little bit, like an eighth of a turn in each direction, and see if that system gauge, this is my wiggle test, you can see that system gauge is following. I make sure that the hydraulic system isn't consuming, meaning that cylinders are not going back and forth, directional valves in neutral, and then I just put my Allen key on there and wiggle it and see if the pressure gauge agrees with the changes I'm making, it's like, okay, good to know that the system is being regulated by the pressure compensator, right? If on the other hand, it doesn't, that pressure gauge doesn't move when you wiggle the compensator, then perhaps things are backwards. You walk up to your pressure compensator and wiggle it, nothing's happening on that gauge. You go over to the relief valve and give it a tiny little amount of turn, just the smallest amount, uh-oh, this this power unit is set backwards. Hey, you know what? We're heading towards the end there. I want to make sure that we answer any additional questions. If there are, I think we're all caught up on questions. And so there's many more learning materials for you on lunchboxsessions.com. Thanks to our wonderful team here at Lunchbox Sessions for preparing all the materials and equipment and producing our YouTube Live today. Thank you to Fluid Power World and also our main sponsor, Sun Hydraulics. Our next YouTube Live will be on October 11th. That's the plan. Keep an eye out for that one on controlling hydraulic flow. We thank you, the participants, for joining us today. Take care and stay safe where you are with your hydraulic work. We'll see you again soon. This is Carl at Lunchbox Session saying goodbye for now. Take care, everyone. <laughs>